Hello, it's uh, Stefan here from Hey You Guys, and we're at the Transylvania International Film Festival, and I'm joined here today by Elizabeth Coulson, who is on the jury uh, here. So, uh, how are you doing, Elizabeth? Are you having a good time so far? Yeah, great time. Yeah. Really well, and good to be here with you. So, I'm going to kick start with a really nice, easy question. How okay. does one judge art? How does one judge art? Um, you know, I think that your judgment can only ever be subjective, which probably means that the system is inherently flawed because it's not a running race where it's fast over the line. So um, I think sometimes you do feel compromised in that you wonder if it's a worthy endeavour. But one of the things that I do love about it is that it presents an opportunity to discuss ideas with other jury members um, and discuss films in a really creative and open forum which I find really inspiring and also the fact that the film festival exists and that there are prizes means that filmmakers can get their work seen and their work lauded and praised and prizes are important for the future careers of filmmakers so I guess there is an upside to the downside where you're judging something which probably shouldn't, you know, is not a technical scientific process. Mm. Do you think it helps coming at this as a producer? Because I guess you've got this kind of all-seeing eye of the whole kind of the whole, the, way, the, the kind of mechanics into filmmaking. Because if you I imagine directors on a jury would be very much be looking at it from a director's point of view, and a, mm. an actor would be looking at it from an actor's point of view. But do you think you've actually got quite a, an advantage almost because you kind of have this kind of backwards, uh, more sort of detached I guess in some ways? Well it, it's interesting because I think I definitely will bring um, a more varied and perhaps a more overarching perspective to, to my um, response to things. Whether that's constructive or not I don't know. I think it depends on what parameters you feel are applicable judging because for example I'll say, wow, they had 10 days to shoot that film, that's extraordinary, or they had 30 days, that seems like a lot of time for what they were able to achieve. Is that something you should bring into the um, process? Perhaps not. Perhaps you just judge it for what it is on the screen. Um, but one thing I do think is interesting, I mean, there is a, a Romanian director on, on our jury, and there's a critic and there's an actor and, and that's really interesting because they will bring a voice to something and bring perspective which perhaps I hadn't considered and or they'll have a different way of expressing a similar response to something and again that's what I find inspiring and and engaging and makes me you know as a producer you can get so entrenched in actually the process of getting a film made that to be here just watching cinema and talking about it really re-engages me with the whole point of why I do what I do. So, And so how many films are you sort of watching a day? It's quite tiring, isn't it? Uh, well, I'd say that it's probably less tiring than other aspects of my job. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm at the moment watching four films a day. I'm a little bit behind because unfortunately due to a shoot that we've got going on in Romania at the moment, and not in Romania, sorry, in Hungary, mm and uh, a post-production in the UK, I just was delayed, so I missed a day, so I had to catch up on five films. And of course, I mean, you've, you've obviously had films in competition at festivals before. You, now having do, done this kind of work on the jury, do you find that now if, you're, if you have been on a film that say hasn't taken home a prize or a top prize, are you now more kind of understanding of it, knowing kind of what goes into kind of the, the picking and the kind of the, the awarding of, of the top film? Uh, Am I more understanding? I mean, yeah, I think obviously when you've got a film and perhaps you expect to take away a prize and you don't, you feel disappointed. But again, it's not something, any kind of a grudge that I would harbour or... And, um, you know, every jury is going to be... It will totally depend on the makeup of the jury and, and being subjective is bound to come into it. And also, as we've seen from films about juries and criminal cases is what often tends to happen is there'll be a dominant voice or there'll be a particular articulate voice or you know other jury members will get swayed so it's an interesting process and and you realize that so many factors come into play um, with all of these things and one tries to be objective but objectivity doesn't really have a place in your response to, to visual storytelling. I'm just wondering too I mean how 
because when I go to film festivals, one of the things I take away most from it is you're sort of learning about the world through cinema. Yeah. There's places I've never been to yes. before that you see movies from Kazakhstan or yeah. Georgia or something like that. And is that one of the, the real joys of, of seeing this many films here? Because I guess you must be learning so much about yeah. societies and cultures that perhaps you hadn't experienced before. Yeah, it's brilliant you say that because yesterday we watched an Israeli film and it was a film where the filmmaker was inspired to tell this story because his daughter had talked to him about conscription in the Israeli army and it was a film that he wanted to explore just how the Palestine-Israel conflict was affecting the next generation. And as the film started to unfold, it was set in a suburban, you know, an affluent suburban part of, I guess it was Tel Aviv. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating because it's a side of things, of, of life that I haven't seen depicted before, perhaps because I haven't seen enough Israeli cinema, I might be. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the things that I find, and this is not specific to the Transylvanian International Film Festival, but it was a comment that Jessica Chastain made after Cannes, is I feel disappointed by the lack of narrative around women and actually um, all the films that I've seen to date, and, and Jessica Chastain said exactly the same thing about Cannes, so it's by no means a criticism. I think it's a statement that you can make at large about pretty much all aspects of global culture is, uh, you know, mostly women are reduced to a sexual situation which is largely around rape or some kind of sexual transgression or they're holding an ironing board or an iron or washing clothes or cooking meals or putting on makeup or generally being, you know, unpleasant with words like bitch and slut applied. And that, I just think, oh, come on, you know, really. You know, we're exploring different things around gender and sexuality and race, but it's really predominantly a white male narrative over and over and over again. And um, that I'd really like to see change and bring different voices to the screen and, and different, more authentic representations. So what do, you, yeah, what do you think we can be done to kind of make those those changes, but, but not just necessarily in the short term, but just kind of a kind of long term strategy? Mm. Well, I think it's interesting because I talk to young women about it and frequently they'll go, wow, I never really thought about that. And I think what's so hard is just like you say that, you know, comment, not you, um, you know, institutionalized racism is often I think people don't even really think about it, that every time you show a you know, a coming of age movie and the coming of age girl is seen putting lipstick on in a mirror, that's just repeating um, a cliched narrative over and over and over again and reducing that character to a kind of objectified notion of what a coming of age means for a young girl. And so I think often people just don't really realize and the only thing you can do is just to, just to champion those stories. Like, you know, it's, there's things that need to be addressed on so many levels, but I think that I just feel find a little bit, and especially for me, you know, I'm, I'm a bit long in the tooth. I've been around for a long time, and I just feel I've seen those stories about. And sorry, no offense to you guys, but I've seen those stories about, you know, boys coming of age and crisis with their dad, and the, and I just, I just want something different and something that, for me, is more representative. You know, I've got three daughters who are all super engaged politically, culturally, intellectually, and I just don't see them represented. Uh, but I mean, one of your future projects, you've got Jane Goldman writing a screenplay, and it's, yeah. it's got obviously Olivia, Olivia Cook in the lead role, and it's a yes. real, Limehouse Gollum, obviously. Yeah. Too. That's a really interesting, yeah. quite nuanced kind of lead female yes. protagonist. Um, what can you sort of tell us about that movie? It's coming out this autumn in the UK. Yeah, it comes out this autumn in the UK, and it's a project my partner Stephen and I have developed for um, a number of years, and it sort of had a stop-start development process, which is typical of, of film. And then when Jane Goldman came on board, it really, really turned it around and she wrote a phenomenal script. And then um, we got Juan Carlos Medina, who directed a, a really wonderful film we saw that was a kind of allegorical story about the Spanish Civil War, um, the effects of, of people and, and the outbreak of fascism. Um, so the films turned out really well. And that's really been Stephen's baby, I have to say, is that we tend to, you know, we, we, we've worked together for 25 years and we've run a company for 12 of those number nine films, but we each tend to nurture a project through. But I'm really, really proud of that and what he and Jane and Juan Carlos did with Olivia Cook and, and Bill Nye and, um, and Douglas Booth. But we do tend to, you know, those are the stories that Stephen and I tend to, 
tell, you know, like Carol and Limehouse Gollum, their finest, again, with a really strong female part in um, Gemma Arterton's character and role with Lone Sherfig directing. And then we're in post-production on, on Chesil Beach, uh, where Sasha Renan plays the lead of an Ian McEwan adaptation, and then filming Colette at the moment with Kira Knightley. So, and it's not like we set out to specifically tell those stories, but I guess it's just something that we're, we're drawn to, and, and there's a huge underserved audience for them. Well, I guess having daughters must help, even subconsciously, I guess, yeah. to make films for, their, for them like, in some I ways. Think so. I think so. I, rem I remember when I went to see Joe Wright's film starring Kate Blanchett and Saoirse Ronan and Hannah, um, and I thought, wow, this is so refreshing to see this film in these two roles. And it really was sort of yet another wake-up call for me, and perhaps it was because my daughters were just then starting to go to the cinema. I remember this classic time is when the children were really young, and I was with um, my husband and my grandmother, who was 92, and we went to the cinema where we lived, which is outside of London, and the eldest daughter was 12, and the youngest were 10 and 7. And Bend It Like Beckham was playing on one screen, and Star Wars was playing on the other. And we were not allowed to take the 10 and the seven-year-old to see Bend It Like Beckham because it was a 12. So my grandmother and I went to see Bend It Like Beckham with a 12-year-old daughter, and my husband had to sit through Star Wars with a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old girls. It just, it didn't interest any of them. And I thought, wow, that is so perverse. So we can't take our daughters to go see Bend It Like Beckham, which couldn't be more about female empowerment, super fun, really enjoyable, disrupting the typical narrative, and yet you're not allowed to go see it. I guess because was there two girls kissing on screen or something? I mean, things like that, you know, just need to change. It's just so completely reductive and absurdist and idiotic in its approach. I mean, similarly, Made in, made like, made in Dagnum was a 15 certificate and Social Network was a 12A. Social Network's a fantastic film, but I mean, really, most of the scenes with women, they're either having coke snorted off their stomachs or giving blowjobs, whereas Made in Dagenham, which is a really important piece of women's history that's silenced, 15-year-olds couldn't go see it because, and a character says the F word, you know, the same number of times as King's Speech, but the censors deemed that the way it was used in Made in like Dagenham was somehow aggressive, whereas the way it was used in King's Speech was humorous. And yet they don't realize that that just feeds into a really, really big problem. So, sorry, I'm going on a no, political really rant, but that's, that's, you know, yeah. it's really, people don't think about these mm. things, you know, whoever those censors are, don't actually think about the implications in terms of empowering girls. And, you know, I really, I, God, this is probably really dangerous ground, but I think, you know, cinema is so important and engagement with art is so, so important. and young company theatre groups provide so much, it's been shown again and again, and I think when we see the violence is perpetrated you know, again and again by disenfranchised young males, and all of this stuff would help redress these things, and, and cinemas can really play a part, and representation in cinema can play a part, and we've seen with gay rights just how important cinema has been, and changing understandings of race. And I'm not saying cinema only needs to serve a political and social agenda, because it's also an art form and it gives great pleasure, it's comedic, and it's, but it's a really powerful um, space that can be used so well. And my, uh, my final, <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. Although I'm sure, I mean, you can tell I'm on my high horse. <laughs> It probably meant that Steve. I'm j guessing if it was Bennett like Beckham, it was probably the Phantom Menace as well. So I think you Stephen got the yeah, got the rough. rough yeah, it was deal. the well. It wasn't. Uh. I mean, and he was good, but for the <laughs> girls, you know, I was just like, really, yeah. the seven and ten year old couldn't go see Bennett like Beckham. That is ridiculous. Crazy. Um, just my final question, because obviously I was on the set of the Limehouse Golem, and I was in the trailer with with Stephen when he was obviously there for the Limehouse Golem, mm -hmm. and obviously you, you sound like you get so passionately caught up in all the projects you do, which naturally you would as a producer, but while he was in there, he was also kind of doing the kind of Carol DVD artwork or something. I was oh, wondering right. about the balancing act of being a producer. When you're, you're working on something and you're right in the middle of it and it's consuming your entire life, and at the same time you've got another project that's just about yeah. to be released on DVD or the Oscars are coming up and you've got to worry about how to campaign for that. I was just wondering about how you kind of 
do that? It seems quite tough. Well, do you know, I, I think in terms of the sort of looking at the whole of my clear career, the fat time that I found it really difficult was when I was also, you know, raising three kids and, and trying to be very present and answering the demands of that that I mean, when I say demands, it makes it sound negative. It wasn't, but that was really tricky. So now they've all left home and they're sort of fully fledged young women and on the path and, and don't seem to have been badly um, affected by a working mother or working parents. So I kind of find the juggling of the different projects uh, without that whole other side to keep going sort of easy by comparison. But it's, you know, I kind of love it. I love problem solving and I love nurturing creative voices. I really, really do. And we tend as producers not to work with just directors for hire, but we hire directors who really have a vision and for a, proje a project and, and we really feel they've got a voice that, that we want to present to the world through cinema. Um, but, you know, like at the moment watching this film, I had calls this morning about the grade and the mix on the film that we're doing in London and calls from the set in Budapest about everything from the catering to uh, a scheduling discussion to a drone shot over the Hungarian countryside. So, you know, there's a, and then an email from someone about um, some still special stills that they need for the next festival and then email from someone else about a screening for the Toronto Film Festival and the Venice Film Festival. So. There is lots of juggling that goes on and you just, you know, I, I find it challenging and, and in a really fun way. I guess if you didn't, it'd be a disaster. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real thank pleasure. You. I hope you enjoy the rest of your festival. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!